So it's a it's a cloudy day in the Hudson Valley. It is. We are in New York. Uh, I'm upstate New York, and I believe you, Hadrian, are also in upstate New York. We are not so far from each other. So um, I think it's really nice to to be able to talk uh, finally in you know like share about our our ideas and to i think we have we have met um in this way you know talking about these subjects so i think it's really nice to to finally have this time to share and to and to acknowledge everything that we have been talking for so for so long mm -hmm. and uh you know i i'm reminded of the first time that we actually began to discuss some of these topics which was when i was teaching uh, giving a lecture and uh you know you you had the the courage to raise your hand and ask some really direct questions um, that i think a lot of students in the class um, had on their minds and so um you know i think that that's really a a defining aspect of of your work and uh and your activism Thank is you. that is that you you go to the the heart of the matter and so i'm happy that we can continue our conversation and do it in such a way that you know where it does us today is in good health uh is in a good state of mind good state of of, of uh, you know physically being healthy and that we can all uh, have the resiliency you know to to go through this this time period um, it's challenging in many ways but you know today we're going to be talking about some of the you know the aspects of culture the strengths that, that bring resilience you know to the everyday yes um, so I think we are on time, and um, then let's begin about this uh, this talk. So I want to thank first the Waking Up Ape team for giving us giving us the opportunity to to do this talk in the first mm -hmm. place and to give voice to to people who can speak up and to give this opportunity to to talk about these different um, projects and different people who are doing such a beautiful impact in the world. Um, and well, that's why, you know, we wanted to do this talk and I wanted to start this talk with you. This is my first time doing a live talk from my Instagram. So if any technical problems come, <laughs> perfect. Um, you know, just let us know. And if you have any questions too, you can let us know as well. We're gonna try to answer as many questions we, we can. And so yeah, so I just wanted to thank the Waking Ape for giving this platform and to and to you, Hadrian, to accepting to do this and to share a little bit about your knowledge with the Lenape Center that we're gonna hear um, you know, your mission and what you have been working on with your your other leaders, no, of the mm -hmm. Center. Um, so I want to introduce myself. Uh, thank you, Waking Ape, for um, putting me as a host of this talk. I'm really excited. It's uh, really nice to to meet with uh, such a talented people like Santiago and Vito, and they have the same um, questions in their life, and they have the same um, kind of beliefs. So we connect in a, such a powerful way. So um, that's actually really, really unique and really beautiful. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I do. Um, I've been uh, modeling for several years and I start on acting and I do and support a lot of humanitarian projects that it have to be everything connected with earth, with water, with pollution, with, um, sustainability. Uh, one of my strongest is sustainability within fashion because I have been in the industry, like I say, for almost 11 years. And I know that that, indus that industry is very powerful and, and, you know, and that's how I create my platform. But I feel that 
things have to change. And knowing about fashion industry and make me kind of question myself and dig more about, you know, the other ways that we can um, kind of work together with nature. Um, so I'm originally from Peru, but I have been living in New York City for uh, about 11 years. And I mean, New York, you know, who doesn't love New York? I love New York and New York is such a, um, a special place uh, in my, has a special place in my heart and is my home for now. But I never forget, you know, my place of origin, which is Peru. And of course I have a very deep connection connection with Peru. And I, apart from going to Peru for, for, you know, to visit my family and my friends and to do, to travel in Peru, I, um, I would love to visit one of my favorite cities in Peru that is Cusco. And in Cusco, you have different communities, um, different, different indigenous communities. And one of them that really catch my attention, it was Chinchero. Chinchero is a community that is uh, two, two hours, two hours and a half from Cusco. And it's just wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, the landscape is just beautiful. Peru in general is really beautiful country and they have so much richness, richness in culture and, you know, in landscape, in traditions. And like I say, I always connected with my country, but, you know, traveling to these different communities, it make me really connect in a deeply, deeply way um, with these communities and with these people. And so I will go, you know, to these local markets to, to, to just visit and see what, you know, what it's all about, what, what is happening in this community. And they have this like really nice um, artisanal market. And the first time I went there, of course, I was just, I wanted to buy everything. And it was, everything was colorful and beautiful. And it was patterns that I've never seen before. And I was just, you know, mm -hmm. amazed about it. And so, because I'm from Peru and I, and I speak the same, you know, language, which is Spanish. I mean, they talk also, a different dialects like Quechua and Aymara, especially mm -hmm. in that area. And I try to communicate, you know, in a deeply, in a deeply way with uh, my Spanish, with them, with these different artisans. And I will, I will be just lost in their knowledge because they knew so much. And I thought, you know, coming from Peru and then going to New York City and then living in New York City for so many mm -hmm. years, I. I thought I knew everything, you know, of course, you, this city makes you like, you know, a super human, which it does. And I think it's wonderful because there's so much energy in New York City. But then going to nature and going yeah. to these communities, um, I think the percentage of, of stress and anxiety is like zero, you know, compared mm -hmm. to, to the cities. And of course, you know, we can talk more about that later, but it's just because nature, it gives you so much freedom and peace in your mind and in yourself and in your body. And that's how I connected with these, you know, different artisans. I try to deeply connect it with them and ask them several questions that it will, you know, make me understand a little bit more. So I, wait, I, I, I go into like, for them to explain me what is being an artisan and what is to, to carry these, um, like these traditions for so many years. Um, mm -hmm. These like, you know, kneading and um, different te kneading techniques and these artisanal um, textile traditions. And they were like, you know, we just get it from our great grandparents that pass it to mm -hmm. our grandparents and then our parents pass it to us. Mm -hmm. And it was one special artisan that she's actually part of my um, project that I'm gonna talk later. She had a daughter, a little, you know, six years old girl. She pillows or, or, or things that they have been making in their communities and in their families. And I was just like wondering, wow, so you're going to teach all of this amazing knowledge to your daughter, you know, daughter, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. how amazed about it. And she said, no. And for me, it was very, very, like very shocking to, 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 that she was so secure of that. And I was like, why, you know, like 
she should know about this. It's like an amazing, um, rich culture tradition that it cannot just, you know, just stop with you. She's like, well, you know, it's, it's, I don't want that my daughter experience what I have experienced all these years that I have to carry this huge bag of, of, of throws and, 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 and things that I have made and walk two hours to the highest point of, of, of the mountain in this market mm-hmm. and sell these things to the tourists, you know, and I don't want that my daughter experience the same thing because I want better um, for my daughter. I want her to have education. I want her mm-hmm. to be a more successful woman in the capital, you know, which is Lima in Peru. And I understood, I mean, of course you want the best for your kids. Um, and that's when I thought, now I understand. Now I understand mm-hmm. the value within fashion connected, how I can come and put my boys with these pe- for these people, you know, for these artisans. And I say, well, no, these traditions are not gonna disappear this, you know, with your generation. Mm-hmm. These have to continue. Mm-hmm. So what I realize is that I have to put my energy, my time into revaluing the artisans, revaluing, empowering, empowering them. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's so important to empower humans, to empower us, to mm-hmm. make us believe that we have the power to do things mm-hmm. and to give them, give them that, not approval, but give them that sense of ex- the strength. Mm-hmm. And I think that is so beautiful. And I say, well, then, you know, I'm gonna do a foundation organization that is gonna be all about that revaluing and empowering artisans. Mm-hmm. So I did that and I created Nuna Awah, which in which it means soul of the artisans in mm-hmm. Quechua, that is a dialect in in in, in the Andes in Peru. Mm-hmm. And it was all about it was about, you know, being the soul of the artisans, being talking to them and like trying to explain the world that they are the ones who have carried this knowledge for so many years and it cannot be disappe- like it cannot be gone. Mm-hmm. And that's why uh, I created this, this foundation. And, and you know, with this, I want to give a lot of information about how these textiles are made. You know, mm-hmm. why it's all of the artisans? Because these artisans, yes, they cannot make 50 things at the same time, but they can do this particular throw or carpet or right. whatever whatever thing you want to use it for um they put everything they put their souls they put mm-hmm. their time they put their love they put their emotion mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. they will they will explain me that if for example one person will um feel a little bit emotional um mm-hmm. they will you know put it in a set of colors if someone will mm-hmm. be a little, you know, it will be like more happy. They will be like more, uh, more colorful. You know, I have different patterns patterns here that it's made from artisans in Chinchero. Beautiful. And um, it's, you know, it's it's a beauty of it. And they will explain me all the process and the process Mm -hmm. is, it's not just making these things. It's everything about it is sustainable. Like Mm -hmm. from the, from the fiber, you know, like the fiber that they use is alpaca fiber, and this fiber and this alpaca, it's uh, they this animal they use it in a more sustainable way. They don't kill the animal; mm-hmm. they shave the animal to get to, to obtain the fiber, mm-hmm. and then you know they process it, they wash it with natural soaps that comes from like roots from the trees, and then you know they they dye it natural dye with natural plants and insects and. It's just like wonderful, you know, to see all this Mm. process because everything's just sustainable and really like no harming nature. And Mm. then, you know, everyone will be involved in the process, you know, from the grandmother, from the daughter to the husband, you know, the husband will Mm. help the woman to um, do all this process. And it was just beautiful. Everything on Mm -hmm. it was just super sustainable. And I personally got so much passion from it and mm-hmm. um and that's why you know with nuna Wag, we just don't want to um share this knowledge and share these um these all these things that i have learned from these artisans mm-hmm. but also we want to empower them and we want to mm-hmm. certify them 
because mm -hmm. like I explained, these things have been passed from generations. So this is in their DNA, but mm -hmm. this is not in the system is not recognized as a proper job. So they are not certified. So they cannot get proper, properly hired or mm -hmm. properly paid. So we experience now that sustainable, sustainable fashion is becoming so powerful. Right. It's not um, like some people is taking advantage of this, you know, and mm -hmm. I can't, I can't let that happen. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so we want to do that and we want to create with Nuna Wak Foundation, we want to um, create this system where um, we can empower them and we can raise awareness about it and we can certify them and they can, mm -hmm. they can be part of the system. They can mm -hmm. get properly trained and mm -hmm. with my platform, try to help them to um, get contacts with different brands who want to be sustainable, right. but they actually have the stamp of Nuna Wag that is a fair trade and it's a fair mm -hmm. exchange with the artisans. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share, sorry, it got too long, but it's mm -hmm. just like a little bit passionate about this project. Um, so the whole, thank you. So the whole topic of this talk mm -hmm. is indigenous future. And I think you, Hadrian, um, you are amazing. You know, you, you are doing so many things that it's um, so true and saying so many things that are so true. When we met yeah. uh, not so long ago with uh, Remy Barbier, uh, he introduced us and he bring me to one of your talk that he was at the Columbia University. That's the one that you were mentioning earlier. Um, I was amazed about what you were saying. I mean, I'm not so... Yeah. I'm not so good into going to these different talks, but um, yours, it was just like pure connection. And I really want that everyone hears about what you have to say about the Nappy Center and your work and what you have been doing. So go All ahead. Right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I, listening to, to your uh, vision for the foundation that you started, um, you know, in many ways, it, it resonates with our work at Lenape Center in that you're providing access to a market, providing access to New York, uh, which may seem uh, difficult and unattainable. And that's part of our work as well. Um, you know, and the audience may, may be surprised to hear that New York City is indigenous it is indigenous land it is an indigenous homeland uh, in fact manhattan manahata'an the place where wood is gathered to make the bows um, in the uh, one of the dialects of lenape so uh, i think it makes sense and there's a uh, a natural fit and harmony to uh, us having a, a discussion, a dialogue, and a collective uh, effort, a combined effort, to continue to, to, be, to be activists and to be advocates for the communities uh, that have been uh, prohibited from having access. So um, again, thank you for sharing that. Uh, the passion is, you know, really comes through. Um, and, and it's something that's heartfelt and, uh, and it's part of, you know, I think uh, something that you brought up one time in, in the lecture is, is identity. You know, identity is such an important and crucial uh, part of, uh, of life today. Um, so uh, a little bit about, about my work, uh, Lenape Center. Lenape Center is a nonprofit, but a nonprofit because that's what... Uh, you know, the, the Western world has to somehow define us and has to create a way of categorizing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But we really are a, a, a collective of, of, um, of, an, of an effort to continue the homeland, to continue the cultural presence that has been uh, erased through the history of genocide and colonization. The Lenape homeland, known as Lenape Hoking, uh, includes all of New York City, includes Manhattan, and geographically goes all the way north to the Catskills, west in, into eastern Pennsylvania, east into a sliver of uh, Connecticut, south down to the state of Delaware, all of New Jersey, 
uh, Western Long Island. So it's a vast territory and homeland that has been home since the beginning of time. Anthropologists, archaeologists will say that, you know, they may have dug to a certain depth and found evidence for human occupation, as they call it, maybe uh, back to 10,000 years, 12,000 years. But traditionally, the origin stories speak of coming from the earth itself, from a tree on top of a turtle shell. And this creation story has been passed down through thousands of years and is still a part of culture today. So homeland is not something that is an abstract idea. Homeland, the territory, is a result of thousands of years uh, since the beginning of time of people uh, being born, of giving life to the next generations, of passing on, of striving, of doing everything possible to give life to the next generations. So Lenape Hoking is, um, you know, was the first homeland, the first area to really come into the wave, uh, the tsunami of colonization along the East Coast in the United States. So in 1609, uh, the Dutch West India Company uh, set up a fort in Lower Manhattan called Fort Amsterdam. Consequently, uh, built Wall Street to keep the Lenape out, the wall of Wall Street to keep the Lenape out. And that was really the beginning of a process of, of genocide, of environmental destruction, which was very thorough, uh, you know, up to 95% of the original homeland being cut down, even where, where you reside. Um, and com compounded by, uh, you know, diseases brought from Europe and forced migrations, a long history of forced migrations into what would end up being Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario. It's a very complex history that very few people know about because it's intentionally been erased. It's been erased from the history books, from the consciousness of uh, New York, and from really a general understanding of where people are when they are in New York City, where they, when they live in New York. But it's important to point out that since the beginning, since the 1600s, there has been an incredible uh, resilience and a pushback and amazing feats of diplomacy and amazing feats of survivance through the generations and through the centuries that the Lenape really managed to not only survive, but bring an incredible amount of, 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 uh, of change in order to adapt to the circumstances. There was no choice but to eventually move out of the homeland by the mid-1700s and begin this process, process of forced migrations. But it's a, the Lenape people endure, exist, are living people, not a people mm -hmm. of the past, not a people who were erased from history. Mm -hmm. The communities are with us today. And there are two nations in Oklahoma Delaware Nation and Delaware Tribe. Delaware Tribe is the main body of the Lenape people. In Wisconsin, there is Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican Nation, also a Lenape Nation. In Ontario, there are two, Canada, there are two small nations as well. So along with that, a diaspora, uh, uh, really Lenape people who live throughout the U.S. and Canada. And in looking at this history, and this erasure. Um, ten years ago, we decided to continue this responsibility of, of ensuring that culture continues, that the next generations, to your point, are able to have access to knowledge and to culture and to songs and to, to dance, to all of the stuff of, of identity, of culture. 
and to push back against this erasure in the homeland. So we started the Lenape Center in Manhattan. And when we began 10 years ago, as uh, my uncle Joe uh, pointed out 10 years ago, that he said, if we don't begin to do something now, we will, we will be erased. We will disappear from the consciousness. And so it's been very much a, a unconventional type of nonprofit work. It's been kind of guerrilla aspects of infiltrating every part of civic life that we could from academia to the, to the nonprofit world, um, to the arts. Uh, we've been very active in bringing that consciousness of place and of people forward. And why did we do that? Just as you brought up your, your question to the artisan, it's so that we can ensure that the next generations will have something to build from, will have a foundation. And we really feel that the way to heal the past, to heal wounds of history, is to do our work for the future, for the next generations. And that is a very, for, that's a very forward thinking way of, of living, of being. And that is, we feel, the indigenous way of, of being, of doing, mm -hmm. of, of thinking ahead, seven generations ahead, thinking of what needs to be done. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's very powerful and I, I think it's, you know, wonderful that people can hear about the Lenape Center and what you guys have been doing to, to protect um, these Lenape communities. And like you say, they still, they still uh, are, you know, like members of the, of the community and they are on Oklahoma, like you mentioned, right? Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Ontario spread out th throughout the country. And so we've, we've held uh, different events through the years, including conferences, symposia, on, on topics that we felt needed to be addressed. So including culture, history, identity. And each time it's been an opportunity to, to, to invite people home on original homeland in New York. Yep. And so and each occasion, it's been a gathering of, of leadership from the various Lenape communities, uh, uh, you know, family gatherings of sorts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there has been too long of, of a, a situation of institutions, of businesses, of um, really every facet of, of life in New York City that has benefited from this history of genocide and erasure. And it's time now that people begin to acknowledge that yes. their own benefit, their own, their own, the own, you know, the fact that they are taking advantage of this this historical uh, deep injustice and trauma is addressed. And and for us, the next step is for the city of New York and the state of New York to take it upon themselves to create formal government to government relations and invite the people home, invite the communities to come home, and to have access to New York, to take part in life, in civic life in New York, and whatever that may be, right? It could be the arts, it could be uh, education, it could be politics, business, mm -hmm. um, whatever you know, is more, most appropriate for the various communities. And this goes back exactly to your point and to your work, right? How do we, yes. how do we continue to engage and provide greater access for community, you know, to market, to have a voice, to be able to sustain and, and thrive. Exactly. I mean, I feel, I feel this, you know, it's, it's all connected. We like, you know, they say we are all one. And even if we are in the system separated by, by a flag or by a country, in these times, especially in the times that we are experiencing right now, we realize that we all want and that we all feel and that we all questions our, like question ourselves with the same things, you know, especially with this time in the pandemic. So mm -hmm. um, I feel that it was, it's so important that, especially for me, you know, just putting me as an example, when I 
left Peru and I moved to New York City, I thought, you know, I came to this wonderful city and especially in Manhattan, because we are not talking about all New York City, you know, like, um, but in Manhattan, when you arrive, it's just this amazing concrete jungle. It's uh, so powerful and is, you know, developed by men hands and it's just wonderful to see all this energy and all these people from all over the world in mm -hmm. this city. But I'm not, I'm not, I, I, don't get me wrong, but they definitely was, you know, nature and green and it's parks and it's Central Park and it's all these things. But I think it's, I didn't feel the connection. I didn't feel that it was a past in New York. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. thought it was a indigenous connection with New York or New York State or, or, or anything. So for me to understand that and to have the knowledge and to let everyone know, not just New Yorkers, but like everyone that lives in New York, to understand that they have this past, that they have this history behind them, behind like where they are standing, it was indigenous communities in there. So I think that's so powerful that New Yorkers connect to that because that's what we are starting to do with, with indigenous people in Peru we acknowledge them more because we know they need them. We need them. We know we need their knowledge. We know we need to understand how they live for so many years in, in, you know, in harmony with nature. Mm -hmm. So that's why I feel like it, that even in developed cities like New York, um, we also can find this connection with indigenous past and indigenous knowledge. So that's why I really wanted to have this talk, you know, with you, with to understand what is the work that you are doing with Lunapi Center. And that's why we, you know, we wanted to call this talk Indigenous Future, because I feel I feel that now is the moment where we have to follow their steps and we have to understand the indigenous knowledge to be able to have a f more sustainable future. Um, and in harm, uh, in more, um, in a harmony uh, connection with nature and with the world to be able to understand all these things, you know. And we wanna, we wanna like share it in a way that we are not calling out, you know, mistakes from the past because you know from the past we learn. And I think we, the only thing we can do is to, to, to understand this knowledge, this past, and put all these things together and then create something beautiful. And that's the power of the human, you know, to make something that we all connect and all believe, and it can just be, you know, pure love and pure happiness and, um, and pure connection. And I think it's a moment where we have to be more connected with mother nature and we cannot, you know, we cannot just not think about it. It's been so many facts about, uh, climate change and the pollution in the earth and you know this time this countdown time that in 50 years you know will be a destruction 30 years 20 years to like 10 years and now we are in a pandemic would anyone really know or have a clear answer when are we gonna get out or when are we gonna have this simple life that we were used to you know but I think it's times where we have to just question ourselves understand this past knowledge from these indigenous communities that they have gone through so much, learn from them and keep moving, you know, and, and, and make a more, a more um, sustainable and in more in harmony future with this knowledge. And I would add that it's actually time to have indigenous people lead the, the centuries of, of erasure of, silencing of, you know, as somebody had just commented here on the feed of, uh, you know, indigenous peoples being in the shadows, you know, there is actually no other choice but to have an indigenous future if we are to have a future on earth. Um, you know, I think that we've, we've been led through many centuries uh, through Western paradigms of colonization of what evolved to be capitalism in a sense of ownership of land, you know, in this illusion that somehow Mother Earth can be, um, you know, brought 
to a geometric plot of land, into real estate, into an idea that something that is a whole system of life can be fragmented down and be owned. Owned. What does that mean, owned? When we ourselves, as human beings, have an average of 28,000 days on earth, that's 80 years, how do we own anything? Mm -hmm. And earth is not simply a square. It's all life on it, mm -hmm. the life that grows from it, the trees, the, the, the bugs, you know, the beings in the ground, you know, all the insects, the wind, the rain, the shadows that are cast above it. It's a whole system of life, and we are a part of that system. As much as we have seen ideas of human domination and human hierarchical uh, illusions of power, these are illusions. And science backs that up. This is not contradictory to the reality of the universe and the reality of Earth. We are and can only be part of this whole system to have a collective, uh, you know, existence. Mm -hmm. And anything else is reductionist to fulfill a capital system of profit, of commodifying ourselves and commodifying life. All of that is illusionary and it's led us down to this path that is incredibly destructive and so destructive that we have whole generations now, a whole generation of people who are even doubting or questioning whether they ever want to have kids. It's an extraordinary time. You know, in, in so much of our human history, this instinct, this need to want to pass on life to next generations has, has been part of our human story. And yet today, young people are, are questioning whether that's something they really want to do. So this area of destruction, of fragmenting ourselves in this illusion away from the whole that is life on earth has to stop. And, and this is knowledge of, that is not new. This is not something that people in the sustainability world came up with as ways of surviving. This is knowledge that has always been there. It's knowledge that has always been part of indigenous cultures since the beginning. And yet, we've been led for the past 500 years into a place of complete and utter destruction. And some will argue, well, you know, capitalism has brought great, uh, you know, great wealth and a great middle class around the world. The costs are enormous if we aren't even sure to exactly your point, whether there will be a world in 50 years. Mm -hmm. In New York City alone, we are witnessing water, the ocean that's beginning to rise. What is the meaning of this real estate if it's all underwater? Mm -hmm. So the balancing, the knowledge is there, has always been there. And I would think that, you know, within the geography of Turtle Island, within the, the geography of all of the Americas are still continuing, enduring indigenous communities that have the means, the knowledge and know-how to lead within their respective territory and their homelands. Let's move and evolve out of this idea of, of nationalism and flags. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's something that was brought from, from Europe, you know, Let's move into understanding whole relationship. You know, in, in Lakota, it's known as metakiwase. We are all connected. We're all related. In Lamape, Lankan to Wakan, relationship, peace, harmony, balance, life. Yeah. I mean, it's just beautiful. I have no words to, to, to describe how how connected I am and how, um, how everything is just, you know, so clear to hear because we are all connected and, and that's something that, you know, and it's not just like you say, like to putting a flag or anything or, or, you know, to, 
to not blame it to, to Europe either because, you know, it's part of the human evolution as well, you know, but at the same time, it's also go back to, okay, we can develop. We are not saying we have to go back to what it was exactly before, but we can work all together with all this knowledge. And the beautiful part of, of you know, that's, that's why you coming from the North and me coming from the South, you know, like kind of having the same understanding of life or kind of trying to research about this knowledge is just powerful you know, and bringing it together into this talk and to, and to be, you know, grateful to know this knowledge and to be able to share it. I think that's the, 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 the power of, you know, of human consciousness. And one of the things that I feel is like, you know, in terms of like people, like we humans, you know, we, we feel sometimes alone. We feel like, you know, it's nothing behind and then we have to do everything in the moment, which is of course valid. Like I think we should live in the moment and we should focus on what we have. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we shouldn't like go against things because we want to solve something. You know, I used to go so many things against because I was just not, you know, I didn't like what people say or what people did, you know, but I feel like if you just understand and then try to connect in a more deep way and then collaborate together, you, you find beautiful solutions, you know, and this, this idea of understanding about, you know, um, land ownership, you know, we're not saying like, you know, you have your home and you own your home and, you know, you have to like, this is now from nature. Of course, it's from nature. Everything is from nature. Everything comes and goes back to nature. You know, we know that from natural disasters. Like, it's no money, no power, no status that will stop that. You know, this pandemic, anyone can stop it. No one knew. Even the, I mean, many scientists knew that something like that will happen because it's not the first pandemic we're experiencing. So we knew this, this will happen. And this is another topic, but you know, we knew this was happening. We just weren't like aware. And this is what also was happening with all these talks about um, global warming, you know, mm -hmm. and um, everything that is happening in the world. Like it started, you know, with the earthquakes and the tsunamis and then the fires and in every part of the world at the same time. So it was like a mm -hmm. little, you know, a little, call from other nature telling us you know something has to stop mm -hmm. and it's so weird because then one this pandemic happened and everyone was gone everyone was just like you know really afraid of what could happen because of course mm -hmm. we are afraid of ourselves but we also are afraid of of the others you know that's mm -hmm. when humans really become so powerful and so connected and they're like if we are doing this quarantine, it's not because of me. I'm doing it because mm -hmm. of my grandparents, for mm -hmm. the older people, for the people that's giving their life now, fighting, you know, for all these nurses, all these people that is like constantly fi fighting this pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for them, like, I mean, they are heroes. So mm -hmm. I don't want to call up, you know, on the people that has, you know, put their energy into making millions and making all these, you know, like, um, power and and mm -hmm. becoming the most powerful people you know but mm -hmm. what is what is happiness you know what is what is wealth what is what is health at the end of the day you know it goes connected what is what is first what is second you know like all these questions i think it goes into understanding um indigenous knowledge because that's when i go back you know of go visiting these communities in peru I see them so happy with so little. And I just was questioned how they can be so how they can be smiling if they barely have, you know, like drinkable water or um, a roof, you know, I was just like in shock, even coming from Peru and coming from, you know, like, I don't come from a wealthy background, but I understand what it is to build yourself and mm -hmm. to, you know, get into being like in an economy position where you can, you know, be 
okay, um, comfortable in this in these times in this society. But I was just like I thought I had a, I had everything, you know. I thought I I didn't need anything more, or or, or or actually sometimes you know I thought I needed more. I needed to do more things, and I wasn't really happy mm. with 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 everything I was doing. So all these questions just come and back in connection with these indigenous people, with these artisans. They were so happy and so connected with what they have. They were working together with nature, having you know the 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 food coming from nature, mm -hmm. the clothes, you know, the fibers coming from an animal in nature. Um, mm -hmm. Everything comes from nature. Mm -hmm. And what I, I'm saying from the beginning, we cannot go back to the same, you know, way of living, but kind of we are being forced in this pandemic. You know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking to build my own, um, like to, to, to grow my own vegetables, you know, in my garden and to, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm always trying to be very conscious of what I'm consuming um, because I think, you know, I have to start from me. Like I cannot mm -hmm. say to people, you have to do this. You know, I, I try to never say that mm -hmm. because it's, you cannot tell to people to do it. I think everyone has mm -hmm. to realize them themselves. And I think this is the time in this pandemic where we are understanding that this mm -hmm. is the time for everyone to, to realize, you know, that every little step we take is going to have a huge impact in the entire mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And I think this is great times for humanity and from, uh, for, in, from human consciousness because we are going to get out from this and we're going to come with so many questions and so many fears and so many, you know, uplifting um, knowledge as well. And we are opening our hearts, our minds to all these new things. And that's why, you mm -hmm. know, again, this, this uh, talk is all about that. It's like empowering um, indigenous people and and to make a statement that it has to be an indigenous future mm -hmm. um, so so yeah so I mean I I wanted to little be like go back into what we wanted to share I think we have uh, shared a lot about uh, indigenous knowledge from what you the work that you're doing with Lunabi Center and the work that I'm doing with Nuna Awa um, in Peru and we talk a little bit about land ownership um mm -hmm. i feel like with land ownership as well it's um it's like to welcome everyone you know to mm -hmm. to really welcome everyone you know from every part of the world because mm -hmm. in the end of the day we are all one um and to have that knowledge what would you think or would like to like give more information about this idea mm -hmm. of land ownership so people doesn't mm -hmm. that, uh, like understand what exactly it is and it's not about you know mm -hmm. we have to give away our lands or the place we live but to understand a little bit more deeply what it is well um you know in our work at the Mapu center every time we have an occasion to speak uh to lecture to address the public to teach we we provide a welcome uh to everyone there in Lenape. And there is currently in the world a movement that began from Australia and New Zealand called land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgement has been a way for people to, whether through their institutions or businesses or, uh, you know, uh, really organizations, acknowledge that the land upon which they are benefiting from is indigenous land and acknowledging that the people uh, who are one with this land, the indigenous people, uh, need to uh, be recognized, be acknowledged, and thereby uh, a commitment can be expressed and can be made towards uh, the future in, in you know, wanting to see change happen on a very local level. And land acknowledgement um, has come to New York. It's, it's gone through Canada. It's becoming part of processes for, uh, again, respective organizations and, and institutions to acknowledge the original people. We also saw that uh, land acknowledgement can, can pose a problem in that in fulfilling this uh, need to recognize the indigenous peoples, it doesn't also guarantee any sort of action, any sort of action going forward, whether in terms of equity or justice 
or going beyond recognition itself. And the question we ask ourselves is, how do moments of acknowledgement actually benefit the people? How, how does it actually impact the communities? And so we introduced an idea of living land acknowledgement based on relationship and reciprocity of commitment of wanting to move forward through action. So one example that I'll provide is the Brooklyn Museum as a museum wanted to have a land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And early on, we uh, informed them of this, this idea of living land acknowledgement. And that led to them actually creating action first. That action was um, uh, offering the space and the means of holding a conference for Lenape community and leadership to gather around this idea of land acknowledgement. And again, these are rare opportunities for us to bring and invite people home and, and, and meet and gather. And so that action has thereby informed their acknowledgement, their commitment to the people. And this relationship-based understanding of place is at the heart of life itself. You know, again, this, this knowledge, this illusion that land is somehow a commodity uh, is, a, is a false uh, premise. The reality is that all life, all that sustains all beings is based on relations and relationship. And so uh, to go back to when we welcome everyone, it's from that premise. We welcome everyone. We first begin by having a relationship, by having a dialogue, by acknowledging one another. And so uh, what we say in uh, the Unami dialect of Lenape is, Nulalenda mohena elipaiku Lenape hokin, gulau sihemo enda achpiku. That translates as, We are glad because all of you came here to Lenape hokin. Live well while you are here. Live in a good way. And that has been a very, um, a very empowering thing for people to hear. It's been a very moving and emotional process for people as well to know that, you know, uh, despite this history, that the people still exist, are still here, are still the voice of the land and can welcome. And so that is going beyond this idea of ownership. Mm -hmm. Empires have fallen, have risen and fallen through history. Territories, if you just look at you know, the, the geography of territories and countries through human history, it's perpetually shifting and changing, right? Borders come up and come down. Yeah. You know, the border in the south with Mexico is not even 100 years old, yeah. right? And yet, what is ongoing, what, what has endured, what has always been, is relationship. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so to f almost, we're going to almost finish our, our talk and I want to um, just briefly, I would love to hear um, with everything we have talked about your work with Linapi and um, indigenous knowledge. Um, what, how do you see now the present moment? Like why is it so important to realize that we have to to follow the way to our ancestors and how it's reflected in our life and in our communities? Well, if we want to have a future at all, you know, it has to be in, in really, um, as I had said, allowing for um, indigenous peoples to lead. And it's also for the rest of those who um, have subscribed to these, these illusions of ownership, of, um, of abstractions in an economic system to begin to open up their minds and their hearts and their ears because the future of all of our children and grandchildren depend on that. You know, this is not, this is not a matter of, uh, of, of putting any of this into, into doubt or question, and this is not political. This is about, you know, our story as a human family. 
And I think that while we work through this pandemic, um, we're going to see, in my opinion, actually, um, you know, while, while we are seeing consciousness begin to, to emerge and people wanting to not go back to how the way things were in terms of injustice and inequities, um, I think we'll have a pushback of people who actually will want to go back to an, to an idea of hyper-capitalism and make it kind of like how the 80s were, where, where it was all about consumerism, you know, and, and we could see that there, there's this kind of like, um, you know, th this desire to just break out of, uh, of this pause that we're in, to go and, 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 and go back into a state of hyper-consumerism. Um, and so now's the time to be all the more uh, steady and certain and, and persevere and continue to move forward. And we have to continue to inform, to educate, to doing what you're doing. You know, I mean, imagine if, if more people uh, as yourself who have the kind of reach as you do would do the best they could to inform and to engage and to teach, you know. I mean, we need more examples as yourself, you know, people who can you know, look beyond uh, just their careers or their job securities, look at really what it means to lead, to lead by example, you know. And so, uh, you know, congratulations on doing that. You know, you are really a, you know, a star as far as I see it in that way. You know, an example for people to follow. Thank you. Wanishi. Wanishi. Um, okay, so thank you. Thank you for, for saying this. I, I'm not going to add anything because I think everything has been said. Um, thank you again, Hadrian, for, for being part of this. It's, it means a lot. It means a lot that you, you are, you know, you. saying, doing this with me. And, and thank you again to The Waking Ape to giving us this this platform, their yes. platform to, you know, share this, this knowledge and share um, all these things we wanted to share with you guys. So thank you for joining us.